I'll ask my fellow panelists to turn on their videos. Okay, there we are. Great. Um, good evening, everybody. And good morning for those of you who are joining us from the US and other parts of the world. My name is Max Delokello. I'm the chief executive of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Kenya. This is the first forum in a series of uh, webinars or a series of dialogues actually that will be hosting on the potential Kenya-US free trade agreement. As you're aware, the talks kicked off sometime mid last month. And while that is strictly a government to government affair, the purpose of this series is for us as a private sector to engage amongst ourselves, spark dialogue, surface critical issues, and more importantly, create an understanding on the potential benefits and opportunities that a Kenya-US free trade agreement could accrue for various sectors of the Kenyan economy. And so today, we begin with a focus on the agriculture or in the agriculture sector, a key sector in our economy, contributing 26% of our gross national domestic product and another 27% of our GDP indirectly through linkages with other sectors. This sector employs over 40% of our total population and more than 70% of the rural population in Kenya. According to figures by the United States Trade Representative, the USTR, goods trade between Kenya and the US grossed about 1.1 billion US dollars in 2019 with the highest traded agricultural products from Kenya being edible fruits and nuts worth over 55 million US dollars, that's about 5.8 billion Kenya shillings, and coffee worth 34 million US dollars or about 3.6 billion Kenya shillings. Imported, uh, we also imported wheat last year from the US worth um, 27 million dollars or about 2.9 billion. Kenya shillings going by the current exchange rates. Last year, the Kenya government launched the Agricultural Sector Transformation and Growth Strategy, a 10-year plan to sustainably transform the sector and ensure food security in the country through increased output and value addition. An FTA therefore heralds the opportunity for this increased output and the various surpluses that we might have to find access market access beyond just Kenya and into the US. And indeed, the Ministry of Trade focuses that even a 5% increase in exports to the US market has the potential to earn the country more than 2 trillion Kenya shillings in terms of export revenues. Furthermore, Kenya and the US have agreed on a strategic cooperation framework to provide technical assistance and build trade capacity to maximize Kenya's utilization of trade benefits in the remaining years of AGOA, which is scheduled to expire in 2025. This framework will also support the development and competitiveness of Kenya's agricultural value chains. Therefore, the questions that I believe many of us are asking ourselves are, for example, what is Kenya's competitive advantage when it comes to agriculture? What are the lessons we can learn from trade agreements such as the US, Morocco, FTA, and indeed AGOA? How can we build on this for better outcomes from our own FTA? How do we prepare the sector? How do we prepare the agricultural sector for investment, knowledge, and technology transfer? How can we ensure that we have high market entry for high, high value market entry for Kenyan products into the US market? Those are just some of the questions that we want to explore this uh, afternoon. And to help us unpack and navigate this discussion, we are pleased to have with us a really, really great and esteemed panel today. And I'll just very, very quickly introduce them. They will get an opportunity to introduce themselves properly once I hand over to the moderator. So I'll start off with uh, Dr. Bimal Kantaria, who's the chairman of the Agriculture Sector Network and managing director of Elgon Kenya Limited. The Agriculture Sector Network is a multi-agency formed 
to coordinate and engage various stakeholders to ensure the growth of the agriculture industry here in Kenya. We also have with us Betty Kiplagat, um, the government and industry affairs leader, Africa and Middle East of Coteva Agri, Agri Science. Coteva Agri Science is a publicly traded global pure play agriculture company that supports farmers around the world with deep knowledge and diverse resources that farms can flourish and, and diverse resources to help farms flourish and move our world forward. We also have George Osure, who's the regional director, uh, Sigenta Foundation East Africa. Sigenta Foundation focuses on small scale farmers and the services, um, and the services, agriculture technology and links to markets with which they can improve their production and livelihoods, ensuring food security for all, sustainability, agricultural transformation that helps close the gap between rural and urban incomes. And finally, and certainly not least, we have Johannes Asefa, um, who might be very well known to most of you, is a former director of uh, agriculture and agribusiness of the East Africa Trade and Investment Hub. Johannes will moderate this session today. And uh, uh, before we begin and before I hand over to uh, Johannes, just a few ground rules. Um, today's session in terms of run of play is structured um, as a panel discussion. So we really want to have dialogue. The first bit of it is going to be um, a, an engagement between the moderator and the panelists. This should go for about 45 to 50 minutes, after which we will have a moderated Q&A where um, we would like you, as the conversation keeps going and evolving, to post your questions in the Q&A tab. I just want to underline that. Please post your questions in the Q&A tab, not the chat tab. Uh, if you post them in the chat tab, we basically will not be able to moderate that. It's important for us to have all the questions in one place. Um, you realize as well that your mic and your video is muted and off. And this will stay the same um, throughout the entire session. However, at some point during Q&A, we might call on some of you to ask your questions directly to the panelists, at which point we will actually unmute you and you'll be able to address your question directly to the panelists. So without much further ado, and with those uh, few remarks, I want to turn it over to Johannes to kick off the session. Johannes. Uh, thank you, Maxwell. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Johannes Asafa, as uh, Maxwell um, mentioned earlier. I'll be moderating uh, today's uh, panel discussion. Um, let me start by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves. They've been um, introduced by Maxwell to some degree, but I would like them to talk about their position and their organization um, briefly. So let me start with uh, Ms. Kip Lagat, and uh, we'll go on from there to uh, Dr. Cantaria and Mr. Osuri. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Johannes. Um, and uh, looking forward to an exciting uh, discussion today. My name is Betty Kiplagat. I lead the Government and Industry Affairs for Africa Middle East Region for Coteva AgriScience. Um, Coteva is, uh, as we've been told, a pure play ag company um, that was listed on the New York Stock Exchange uh, last year, June. So we are one year in, and during this one year in, we've gone ahead and launched our sustainability goals, and I do hope that most of you will get an opportunity to look at them. Um, what is important is Coteva AgriScience has been in Kenya for over 20 years, um, trading under the PANA, Pioneer, and um, Dow agrochemical uh, products. So looking forward to an exciting uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Bimal Kantaria. Uh, I'm the managing director of a company called Elgin Kenya Limited, which is uh, the largest agro inputs company in the, in the country. Um, we do chemicals and fertilizer, seeds, irrigation equipment, uh, so companies like Cortiva and Sugenta, we represent them in, in certain products in this country, including BASF and all these other multinationals. A lot of them are American-based uh, multinationals. We represent them here in Kenya. I'm also the, the chairman of an organization called the Agriculture Sector Network, which is the umbrella body of all the private sector agriculture on um, institutions in Kenya, uh, in, including uh, BMOs and research and development agencies. As, uh, and we're trying to bring everybody together under one umbrella. 
I'm a director at Kenya Association Manufacturers for the last 20 odd years, and I'm also chairman at CAM for the agro-processing sector and the agriculture sector at KEPSA. And finally, I'm the, I'm the chairman of the Euro EU EPAA, the European Partnership Agreement, Trade Agreement, uh, private sector uh, team that was representing Kenya in the EPA negotiations. And I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Johannes and uh, fellow colleagues, the panelists. My name is George Osura, as you have told, and I work for the Sigenta Foundation East Africa, which is the representative office of the philanthropic arm of Sigenta, the company. Our work, as uh, mentioned earlier on, is transfer of technology and ensuring that pre-commercial farmers move into the commercial stage. We work with across every single organization and and we have managed to partner with them successfully, right from the public service, individual companies, farmer groups, and even the regional economic blocks, working, for example, linking the ECOWAS and uh, COMESA. And uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm be glad to share with you some of our experience, which we'll, uh, we hope can contribute to a successful FDA, a beneficial one. Thank you, Johannes. Well, thank you, panelists, for introducing yourself. Um, as you see, we're already getting some questions, and some of them, uh, some questions have already been submitted to us in advance uh, in anticipation of this discussion. Um, some of the questions are uh, sort of elementary issues on how do I export, how do I use this, or the, um, what is the, the definition of this, or how does a GOA work, uh, how does the FTA work. Um, and, and so just to give the baseline understanding, I'll just say a few, few things about AGOA and FTA in general before we uh, get uh, started with uh, discussions. Um, AGOA, uh, as you may know, was enacted in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000, and it was essentially designed to provide preferential duty treatment uh, to sub-Saharan African countries. There's an eligibility requirement Currently, about 40 countries um, uh, are eligible or are using it, AGOA in Sub-Saharan Africa countries. Of course, Kenya is one of them. Um, the act has a sunset provision, so every so and often it has to be reauthorized. The last reauthorization was in 2015. It was reauthorized for 10 years, which means uh, the uh, AGOA Act will end uh, uh, by 2025. Um, AGOA in general seeks to promote uh, trade and investment between uh, South Saharan Africa and the U.S. and promotes economic growth, development, poverty, reduction, democracy, the rule of law, and stability. Um, so far in the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, AGOA has uh, provided lots of opportunities for South Saharan African countries. Uh, some of the achievements so far are the 350,000 direct uh, jobs created and the 1 million in direct jobs created, uh, about 100,000 jobs created in the U.S. alone through these trade uh, arrangements. In, in 2019, the GOA plus GSP, the Generalized Services uh, Systems of Preference uh, Arrangement, which is another uh, layer of uh, duty-free uh, mechanism, um, the South Saharan Africa alone uh, was able to export about $8.4 billion worth of uh, goods, um, about 55% of it being oil. Um, the largest AGOA exporting countries in South Saharan Africa are Nigeria, number one, mostly oil, uh, with about $3.1 billion. South Africa, the second, was $2 billion, uh, mostly vehicle nuts, uh, vehicle parts, and wine. Um, Angola is number three, again, mostly the oil, 605 million, and Kenya is number four um, at 518 million. And Kenya's uh, GOA exports to, uh, mostly constitute apparel, macadamia nuts, uh, and uh, cut flowers, uh, and a few other things. Um, that's generally a GOA. And so when a GOA was initially designed, uh, you know, a GOA is just a one-way preferential treatment, like uh, everything but arms uh, for the Europeans to allow developing countries access to these rich uh, developed markets that go with the US and EBA with uh, Europe. Uh, but it is um, 
has requirements and has sunset provisions and the program could end at any time. So that has affected the ability of investors uh, or to make long-term capital investments. Uh, part of the arrangement was this was sort of a bridge to uh, a future two-way trading system. So even in 2000, when AGOA was debated uh, in the legislative history of AGOA, you will find there was discussion of about uh, a free trade agreement uh, being developed sometimes on the, um, you know, in the future. And the 2015 reauthorization sp explicitly also talked about um, or asking the administration and USTR to prepare and to plan for uh, an FTA scenario uh, before this reauthorization ends. So uh, this, is, this is where we are. As a result of those historical and legislative prerogatives, we are at the cusp of starting an FTA uh, free trade uh, agreement uh, with Africa, with South Sudan Africa. And Kenya has been selected as the first test country, a model country for the first free trade uh, agreement negotiation. Now, both countries have set out uh, objectives, um, and those documents are available online. Uh, the USDR has published its set of objectives for the, uh, the FDA negotiation. The Kenyan government also has done the same. And just briefly quote some of the uh, priorities or objectives for the U.S. Uh, uh, government. Uh, the U.S. government would like to achieve essentially comprehensive duty-free market access for U.S. industrial goods and strengthen uh, disciplines to address non-tariff barriers uh, that constrain U.S. exports. Um, there are a couple of other things like strong standards for protection and promoting um, IP rights, uh, go uh, government procurement, transparency, political economy uh, issues, subsidies, and so on and so on. Uh, the Kenyan government also has um, outlined a number of objectives. Uh, of course, the biggest being market access is a, a, the biggest objective. Um, it is estimated that uh, if Kenya is able to improve its agriculture exports by 5%, uh, you will see about 1.8 trillion shillings uh, in exports to the U.S. So agriculture plays a major role and important part of the Kenyan government's objective in this FDA negotiation. Um, as an overall strategy, the Kenyan government has indicated that um, the Kenya wants to sign an FDA agreement that, quote, uh, pays fidelity to Kenya's commitments to existing trade agreements, such as the uh, EAC, uh, the AFTCA, and, and others. Um, Kenya would like also to protect its nascent industries and agricultural sector, increase the U.S. investment, and ensure market access for um, all of its products and services currently uh, exported under AGOA uh, post the expiration of uh, the AGOA Act in 2025. So with that sort of background note, um, I'd like to dive in quickly and start the discussion. Um, I want to start with uh, uh, Beatty. Um, from your understanding and from your organization understanding uh, of the FTA, what do you think are the most beneficial aspect of it? And what do you hope to achieve uh, through this FTA? Of course, the FTA is still being negotiated. We don't know the exact terms, but we have an idea, we have precedent in Africa with the Morocco FTA, but from your understanding from your organization, what are your hopes and aspirations uh, um, out of the FTA? Um, and thank you for that. Um, I will start first by saying, of course, we must look at Kenya um, and the uh, uh, role agriculture plays. Um, in in, uh, in culture plays the, a very vital role and that must be underscored and during this um, FTA negotiations uh, because we understand that the Kenyan households um, I, that are exclusively engaged in agriculture contribute to about 31.4 percent uh, to the reduction of rural poverty and agriculture remains a key um, element for or important uh, player for all in Kenya. So for my organization, whatever agri-science has been, we've been in the country for over 20 years and we want to continue to stay here. But what we are excited about the, IRM, the FTA is the issue of transpar uh, transparency. We believe that the regulations will be very predictable, they'll be transparent, I will know there'll be defined timelines, anti-counterfeit issues will be addressed, of course, intellectual property um, discussions will come to play. And intellectual property is very important um, for organizations like ourselves. 
But what I find very exciting about intellectual property um, that I think will also benefit Kenya is that the fact that small companies in Kenya that perhaps have never thought um, they could protect um, their plant breeders rights or their patents, their trademarks, their copyrights um, will benefit from this um, free trade agreement. And why do I say this? I say this uh, because because um, the system will be revitalized. We already, I can see already, we're doing a review of the intellectual property regime in uh, Kenya, uh, trying to merge them to become one organization. Um, there'll be enforceability. I think for a long time, um, infringement of copyrights, infringement of trademarks of um, other IPs or even plant breeders' rights, um, that enforcement has not been there. I think by uh, looking at the FTA, we will be adopting um, IP principles that um, are based on the WTO, that are also based on um, the US IP laws, and therefore there'll be a predictable and a transparent system that will benefit local scientists, international organizations such as ourselves. So um, I think uh, I also see an access to customs, uh, predictable customs, ease of movement of goods across borders, uh, be it uh, phytosanitary and phytosanitary requirements. So there'll be a whole regime of regulations that will be predictable, that will will be transparent, I think will be very accessible to both parties across the globe, uh, across US and into Kenya and Kenya into the US. Uh, thank you, Beatty. Uh, Biman, let me move to you. Um, perhaps from our panel, you are the, uh, the only indigenous uh, Kenyan company, uh, an organization that has been uh, in business now for over 120 years. Uh, with now operations spanning six countries. Um, you, you sort of on this panel represent uh, uh, Kenyan businesses uh, in a way. Uh, and what are the concerns or at least the opportunities people are looking at? So divide them into two, looking at the opportunities as well as what might be areas of concern. Yeah, so Johanna, so, I, I, so let me start off by saying this is, this is not a, uh, like, a, um, a, like a Goa or the EPA. It's not a preferential agreement. I think you mentioned that right at the beginning. It's a free trade agreement. So there is reciprocity on both sides, which in, in our mind is a scary thought. And now let me tell you what we want. So, I, so you, I put you in the picture of where I'm coming from, but let me tell you what we want as Kenyan companies or Kenyan farmers. We want preferential access to the, the American market. Zero tariffs and zero quotas is, is the most important. Uh, we will, secondly, we want is we want a phased reduction of tariffs into Kenyan market. Now, why I, why I say that? Because in my introduction, I said this is a FTA. Um, so somehow we have to find a political will in this one. We don't want large American farmers dumping their chicken legs into our Kenyan market. It'll kill our livestock straight away. So we want a phased reduction of tariffs into the Kenyan market. And unfortunately, the objective document you mentioned earlier on that's available on the website says there's reciprocity. So the American market opened up, we have opened up our Kenyan market, which is not what we want as a, as a Kenyan company. So we need to find a, a balance where, of course, America's such a huge economy uh, and Kenya's being relatively young, we need to find a phased balance between the, the two. We need to have concrete financial commitments of investment and trade into Kenya. We understand from that object, that document you talked about, that the Americans who want to use Kenya as a launching pad into Africa, which is fine, but we don't want to be a trading post. We want Americans come and invest hard dollars, feet on the ground. We want them to put money in the country, increase investment into a Kenyan agriculture, increase trade. We want capacity building. Um, you know, we have the American agriculture industry is very strong. I mean, you have amazing data, information, technology, that's the stuff we want in this country. We are, we, we, we are good, but we can get better, and we need American help in getting some of these technologies into, into this country, including capacity building. We want people to come into this country helping us with agriculture. We talk about subsidies. You know, it's controversial to say, but of course, American farmers are highly subsidized, uh, and Kenyan farmers are not. In fact, our country, for, for the size we have, we have very little subsidy programs happening to the Kenyan farm, but the Americans are complete opposites. So we need, if you want to export to our country, we want to make sure that the 
unsubsidized farmers allowed into Kenya? How can we compete with subsidy, uh, you know, subsidy backed <laughs> farmers coming to our country? We can never compete. So we need some sort of equality in that. Uh, no dumping. Dumping is a big problem in our market. So, you know, if you look at, again, I mentioned wheat, you've got, you've got seriously big wheat farmers out there. Uh, and, and for you to export to our country at, at very cheap rates, it's very simple. I mean, and you have a whole bunch of, you know, financial incentives to export. That's what worries us a lot. So, in, uh, Betty's already mentioned uh, IP, of course, protection of IP. But worries us, like if you have GM seeds, uh, you know, it worries us that uh, uh, places like India have said, there has to be a phased way of, putting, of controlling IP. You can't tell us to buy a GM seeds and then you expect us to pay royalties for the next 10 or 20 years. That, that's not a sustainable model. I think we, we need to be sure where we are as partners, where, where we are equal intellectually, but not equal financially. And, I, I, and I'm sure you all understand what I'm saying. So we, there are definite wants we want from this agreement. We're fully supporting it as private sector. But there are provisions in there that we need uh, us to really think it through before we start signing on the bottom line. Thanks, Johannes. Um, just to follow, what are the opportunities? So you've highlighted sort of the concerns, but the opportunities you uh, definitely will uh, access uh, through the FTA. Yeah. So, so you, you mentioned about exports of nuts and some of these things into the into the U.S. market. Uh, to be honest, we have we got a, we have good industry, but not enough yet to export fully into the into the U.S. market for agriculture. Um, so for if, it's, if you look at our flower growers, we've had, a, in the last one or two years, we've had a lot of interaction with American buyers of Kenyan flowers. The American market is slightly different. They have small heads. It's very cost effective because they have South America exporting flowers to the, U, to the U.S. market. So for Kenyan growers, it's not going to be easy just to put, a, put it on the plane and export to, to American market. The Kenyan flowers are generally big headed. I mean, the size are big. So we have to modify our growing pattern. So it's going to take us a little bit of time to adjust to the American markets. Once that's opened up, you can imagine it's a big market for Kenyan horticulture and floriculture exporters. We've got livestock. So, uh, you know, one of our big exports to the UAE, of course, is camels and, and, and other kinds of meats and hides. Again, a, a big market in the Americans. Uh, so there are plenty of opportunities. We also want American investment into Kenya. We want... Your, your, your big farmers, your big investors coming to Kenya and putting, you know, uh, 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 investing in our, in our countries. Again, to export to US, we have no problem with that, but we do need, we, we see lots of good things happening uh, and we open for all of those suggestions, but I think we have to be careful that we don't go rushing into this, into this agreement. Thank you, Bima. Um, I'm going to move to George now. George, touching upon the same question of opportunities and challenges, but I want to slightly uh, focus it to uh, lessons that we've learned so far. You know, in, in Africa, uh, Morocco, for example, has a, an FTA, the first one on the continent. So Kenya is not really technically, but Kenya will be the first sub-Saharan Africa uh, if Kenya signs an FTA. So, if, you know, looking at the Moroccan experience, um, what do you think will be the benefits and, and maybe the challenge? Bimal has really gone through in detail and challenges, maybe on the benefit side and looking at the lessons learned from Morocco, uh, what do we expect uh, from this FTA? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, one of the most important things in an FTA is essentially like we've heard from, I think Betty mentioned it and Bimal, it's uh, and even in the opening remarks, it's a public private, it's a public led negotiation that's government leads it therefore essentially you're looking at a public private partnership that's the bottom line so one of the things that happened in uh, in morocco as they were negotiating was they had a sector strategy which we have discussed here and the agricultural sector strategy in morocco had to be rewritten not because of any right or wrong thing but to ensure that their interests are taken care of, the local farmers. And they took care of the interests based on our interests, their, their own interests. So what, for example, they would, they ring fence the cereals, they ring fence the beef, they ring fence the poultry and so on, whatever they needed. And then they started the negotiation from that launch pad. And that is the source of the Green Morocco Agricultural Plan. It, that's how it came about, to be able to do that. Secondly, it also required a lot of what we had a very appropriate word used of predictability in the system 
So most of the farmers now had to adopt certain strategies and ways of working. So you'd find that farmers who are growing fruits had to do them in a certain way, had to adopt certain varieties. And varieties is technology transfer, and varieties is agreements that go across borders. That's one of the elements they did. So you'll find today the farmers had huge jumps in their export markets, and I was fortunate to visit one of them in Morocco, whose nectarines are all grown for the US market. And like we've had, they are competing with the rest of the world, they are competing with the internal American market. The next side of it was the capacity building. In the US, most of the companies there and the universities are the source of technology. So for example, they have what you call foundation seed companies that belong to a university. So if you want groundnuts, you'd go to University of Georgia. If you want rice, you go to University of Arkansas. If you want soybean, you'd be in Illinois and so on. So those foundation seed companies is exactly the word we talked about that capacity building. So that creates that level playing. And that transfer, for example, is already in fact with a lot of Feed the Future programs, whereby we are getting a lot of seed and opportunities in the soybean from the University of Illinois. Same with livestock, same with University of uh, California. That's one side. The second side of it, and most important is, because of that, it has created a sense of regard for intellectual property. And your opening remarks were very appropriate in that, as there is inflow of technology, or we are signing appropriate intellectual property inwards into Kenya, what about the existing neighboring markets? That's EAC. What about Comesa agreements? What about the Africa Trade Agreement? And so on. So that is where I think the, it's appropriate. The public service leads it. It's appropriate. We look at the longer term part of it. So yes, we'll eventually have to change a bit of our strategy. Thank you. Um, going back to uh, Beatty, and, and I want to focus on the IP rights because it's come up uh, from all of our speakers, uh, panelists. Just zeroing in on IP rights, uh, Biman mentioned um, uh, GMO, for example, GMO seeds, and uh, control and phased sort of uh, approach to uh, acceding to the various protocols or, or agreements. Um, is the concern uh, um, in a way uh, outweighs the benefits um, in terms in terms of the opportunities that exist? Um, do you do you think the 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 IP potentials will somehow outweigh the the, the concerns uh, that might be there in a, a so do we have a value uh, discussion in terms of uh, the pros and cons of what could happen with the IP rights and what could lead to more investment or, or, or less investment, um, whether this will have an actual net um, value add in terms of Kenya's ability to grow its agriculture, feed itself and feed its neighbors and be able to have a very uh, competitive agriculture producing. What, what's the IP role in this space? Maybe I. I said too much, but <laughs> I, I hope you understand what I was trying to say. Okay. Um, I just want to say, first of all, um, a, a harmonized intellectual tea environment um, gives everybody a level playing field. I alluded to that point um, in the beginning. I think it's also a good condition for us um, to negotiate um, this because again it doesn't just benefit the U.S. companies as I said it will benefit um, Kenyan researchers. But I want to focus on one particular branch of IP that will really do agriculture and that's the plant breeders right. Um, in Kenya we already acceded to UPOC which is a sui generis uh, intellectual property rights system, uh, uh, acceded to 1978 and then moved on to the 1991 system. So it is uh, that we are already um, promoting using Kenya. Um, it is 
critical for us here is I see there is an opportunity for us to encourage other countries that are using the ARIPO or ORP system um, to also look at acceding to um, the UPOV um, type of regime, which is a sui generis system, as I've said. Um, it allows and acknowledges the principles of essentially derived um, varieties that um, we already know here in Kenya. Um, we also know that um, by, by recognizing that, we are defining that the breeders in Kenya will still be recognized under the system upon which we were at. Um, CAFIS under CAP 326, uh, laws of Kenya, uh, allows our breeders to register their rights. Uh, and I know the National Research Organization already does that. What does this do? It actually enables the system to grow. I am a strong IP believer, and my background is in intellectual property law. So that's the first thing um, I know. I have a background in intellectual property law and why I've always believed and um, supported that we need IP so that we can grow our innovations. I want to move to the next question that really I know is on the top of everybody's mind and that's the one of GMOs. Um, I don't think GMOs are a premise upon which the FT will be limited. It will not be one of those things that if you don't accept biotech or if you accept biotech, then the FTA will not continue. Biotechnology is one of the tools that companies such as ours, whatever, have. And again, I call it a tool because in the agricultural space, there are so many tools that can use. You can use conventional um, uh, material, you can use biotech, you can um, to improve your soils. So there are so many tools that one, and even gene editing is one of the tools that we are looking at the moment. Um, so looking at um, biotech crops, and I know in Kenya we have um, BT cotton that is currently being commercialized, approved by the Kenyan government. And uh, cotton is not one of the things that um, I think we, we didn't benefit so much. I know we did a lot of things and our goal. But there is an opportunity to grow our cotton production, improve the value chain of the sector, and be able to uh, supply some of our finished cotton products to um, the U.S. Because the standard will um, already be at the right appropriate uh, using SPS, sanitary phytosanitary measures, uh, using um, all the standards that are required under this platform. I think we will create a new access, uh, a new market for our um, uh, cotton farmers. Um, there is also opportunity for other products, uh, research in other areas using biotechnology, perhaps for cassava. We know that there is an application in Kenya right now uh, for a GM cassava resistance to um, virus um, uh, disease. Um, so there will, that technology was donated into Kenya because cassava is not a priority um, crop, perhaps for the internet national companies, US companies perhaps would be, uh, but it's a local requirement. It's a local problem, but that requires technology being transferred to other companies. So um, what we are looking at and what is exciting, there'll be more and more technology transfer um, on technologies that are available that can be used by local research organizations um, to um, add onto our breeding platforms. So um, I hope that um, people will reach out and ask us where are opportunities for our local research organizations, where can we now, and we're already doing that even uh, through so many other gene editing technology work that we're doing here in Kenya with the Kenya Agricultural uh, Livestock Research Organization. So thank you. Uh, well, just continuing on the topic of C, let me go to George. Uh, I'll come to you, Bima. Uh, isn't there a concern that um, the U.S. seed companies, for example, would be mostly interested only in the commercial um, crops or commercial seeds and may not be interested in staples uh, or orphan, what we call sometimes orphan crops, African crops. Uh, cassava was mentioned earlier. And that's the realm of uh, NGOs, nonprofits, and development. But from a commercial perspective, focus might be on the you know French beans, all the lucrative um, commercial crops, and would that really benefit um, K 
Kenya. I, I looked at Tanzania. Uh, we were doing some work on UPO, for example, trying to help Tanzania um, exit to UPO. And one of the things that struck me was um, uh, almost exclusively the local seed companies were dealing with staples and almost exclusively the international companies were dealing with cash crops, you know, sunflower seeds. And isn't that a concern? Um, and, and in a way that also creates a, a barrier uh, because the large U.S. companies, international companies have resources to invest in research and development and production. Uh, and some of that uh, may not really flow into local ownership and, and knowledge. Um, how do you address those concerns, George? Yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, that's a, it's a very appropriate concern that uh, the people have. I mean, the, our Kenyan businesses have and our farmers and so on, and the agriculture sector. But on the contrary, it will be one of the things I mentioned that is changing the strategy and you use the word orphan crops. So if I take that as an example, there is now a lot of change in the world, the way even in the US, the way people are eating. There's a very high demand and an exclusive niche markets for some of the things we are not taking as part of our core production units. So for example, what will happen on the day somebody asks you for pigeon peas or for cow peas? or for dolichos, which we commonly know in Kenya as Njahe, those are the foods now that are being ground to feed into animal feeds and poultry feeds. We don't have the adequate quantities of seed. So among those kind of activities, those are some of the elements which we have seen that there is now demand growing even locally here. And we need to strengthen that capacity and use that speciality. That's one side of the story. On the next side of it, if you look at the US farmers, the highest earning soybean farmer in the US is the one who is selling conventionally bred soybean seed or organic soybean seed to Japan. They get three times the value the GM soybean farmer gets. It's high, it's very high. So there's both of those opportunities. I think Betty made that very clear that these are just technology transfer mechanisms that we must be aware of and how to make use of our local cultural. So in that respect, what I mention is that the seed unit or the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Unit is the, will be a very key and transformative organization towards effecting the benefits to the local farmers, in the local businesses and local farmers, because cultural deals with both livestock and agriculture. So both of those are intertwined with their legal processes and whatever they and, and so on. So I think still there's opportunities and those are the negotiations that I mentioned that a lot of these organizations all had ring fenced, like in Morocco, they ring fenced their cereal side of it and slowly opened it up once they had built the capacity. So capacity building, very key word, predictability, very key word intellectual property, very key. So I think, thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Bima, let me come back to you. Um, the flip side of, uh, well, the concerns you raised earlier, excellent uh, list of concerns. Um, there, there is also, you know, the reason Kenya is in this negotiation is to, to have market access to the U.S., but there's also concern from the U.S. side, for example, the, the famous U.S. agricultural lobby group is going to really um, try to protect its, int its interests um, is through the USDR. Well, what are the areas you think uh, that you, Kenya will face challenges in terms of uh, market? Cotton was mentioned earlier. You know, part of the intellectual property discussion is, for example, if Kenya becomes competitive in growing cotton, and Kenya wants to export cotton to the US, but US also grows cotton. Um, there are other areas uh, and agriculture, uh, you know, Goa, with all its success, has a you know, limited agriculture um, tariff lines. Uh, and that has been the sort of the point of criticism for Goa for a long time. But in FDA, you open up every sector and it's all negotiable. What are the areas where you expect resistance from the US side and where you want the Kenyan government to uh, strongly negotiate in terms of market access uh, to the U.S. market. 
So, so I tell you what really worries us is this, you, you connected Agoa, you, you brought up Agoa. So Agoa, of course, is the, 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 the real success story in Agoa for Kenya was our textile industry. Uh, it, it's been, it, you know, beyond our dreams, uh, it, it, it was so successful. What worries us uh, is that we, we, we really worry that the, the, you will use, well, I, when I say you, I mean the American <laughs> countries, will use um, the textile industry and say, we won't allow Kenyan textile imports into our country if you don't open your markets. And that's what, these kind of trade-offs is, you know, we worry with the American negotiators and they're, they're very good at these sort of negotiations. Uh, okay, but let's look at the positive side. You know, American is, is it's, it's 350 million population, highest GDP, you know, per capita uh, GDP. There's plenty of opportunity for us in there for agriculture. But like you said, uh, we, under AGOA, we, we never had proper access to the American market. Uh, and I hope that this, this particular agreement, uh, if, if it's done correctly, will be a, a massive opportunity for us, including things like aviation. If you look at Kenya Airways, it's a very important part of our supply chain and logistics. And we were very happy a couple of years ago when Kenya Airways was allowed access into, I think it was at the, one of the airports, Florida or, or wherever, I can't remember, New York airport. So I think some of these, some of these things are very important. If we broaden the picture a little bit, we want opportunities in tourism and other things. But I suppose those are also critical part of the whole big picture of, of this FTA. And the other sectors that are not part of Ago, I think we need to be included in, into this one. So, so there are big opportunities. We want your tourists to come to Kenya. We want your, uh, your, your big farmers to come and plant in this country. So there are plenty of good stuff happening. Uh, and I think it can happen. And, and to be honest, we, we, we met... Uh, we met the government, Kenyan government officials on Monday, the trade team, we met them under Kep's umbrella. And I, I have to admit, we have a, a very capable guy in the name of, uh, you know, PS Ambassador Weru. He's, he's very switched on under the Libby Shop of CS Meti Minor. Uh, and they, they met us uh, and they, they, they took us through the whole process of negotiation, um, not in detail of the actual thing, because that's a confidential agreement between government to government. But they did tell us that, you know, private sector will be fully participating in in the discussions in their side, in the government, Kenya government side, and they wanted to be much more private sector driven. So we've, we've put in our uh, position papers to government. We've, we've, we've created one on ASNET. We've got a very strong technical team on ASNET. We're putting a position paper in there to tell them what is our opportunity? What do we want? What do we hope from this agreement? But I, I, I want to emphasize, we, the Kenyan government team is very capable under CS Betty Mine and Professor Weru. I have great faith in them. I think we all felt when we came out of the meeting that this is exactly the type of team we want in uh, negotiating our position. Again, for us, it's new. Uh, this kind of FTA is a new for us, and I think we have to build capacity in the Kenyan system. But uh, if done correctly, I think we have great opportunity in, in the U.S. markets. It's a hugely rich market. You know, there are a great deal of um, uh, consumers who can use our stuff, bring your tourists into our country. So I, I don't want to be overly negative, um, Johannes. I want to say agriculture is one of the, 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 the areas we want to look at. We want to look at aviation, tourism, textiles. But we, you know, we, we've heard lots of things about American negotiators, which sort of worries a little bit. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, your, your list of items you've raised are excellent. I mean, these are the concerns most countries get. I've worked on WTO negotiations before, and I, I can tell you those are the areas uh, LDC countries usually are concerned. So it's natural. It's not really out of the norm. The issues you raised are on point. Uh, just to follow up, uh, earlier uh, there was mention of competition uh, with U.S. firms. Um, to what degree expect uh, American firms to enter the Kenya market or they will uh, continue, do you think it will continue to operate through uh, your company, uh, companies like yours through representation? As, as we know, Americans are not really, they don't have a large presence in Africa in general. I think Kenya is one of the few bright spots where American firms uh, have you know, operated for, for some time, either directly or indirectly. Um, to what degree do you expect uh, the signing of uh, the FDA will encourage, um, you know, setting up of shop locally uh, in, in Kenya? So, so you're right. Um, the history of American companies in Kenya hasn't been great. They, they tend to use people like us distributors to come into the Kenyan market. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, you know, I, I think we have to be clear that the Kenyan businessman is very clever. Why is Kenya so successful in the African model? I think we as Kenyans are, are, are sharp people where, where we've, since independence, we've been a purely you know, a, a 
uh, open market. We were uh, uh, we, we we didn't follow the Tanzanian and the other countries' model of being a little bit restrictive in our business. Our borders have always been open for business, and that has trained us to be quite quite clever in a Kenyan as a Kenyan businessman. That's why we we look at East Africa generally. Kenyan manufacturers and Kenyan traders have been quite strong in the region. So I think it's not a bad thing um, using the resources of Kenyan businessmen. I think using distributors is not a bad model. If you look at, uh, unfortunately, if you look at companies like GM and other kind of, uh, you know, multinationals, who unfortunately haven't had a great experience because maybe the model they use and the management techniques they use in America are not the same that I required in Africa. And that's where expertise like us comes in. So partnerships are, are critical, I think. Strategic partnerships with Kenyan businesses are very important. That's why Sagenta and Portiva, and they use companies like ours because we have the local knowledge, we have the local, you know, we, we feel the Kenyan businesses, we understand what's going on locally, the politics are quite dynamic as you understand. So this sort of partnership is great, but I, I still think that we have plenty of potential for, for, for Americans to, to piggyback off our knowledge, come into Kenyan markets directly, investing in our farms. They have got really clever IT, they've got really good techniques, technology. Either they share it with us or they go directly, either or I think the market is open uh, and we're ready for competition. I, I, I am never scared of a competitor coming into my field. I, you know, it just sharpens us, makes us cleverer, makes us quick. I think Betty's smiling, but <laughs> Betty, we're ready for competition. Kenyan businesses are here to fight, no problem. <laughs> Well, I'm going to ask one round, one question uh, to all of you, and then we'll go into, I believe, a Q&A pretty soon uh, from the uh, audience. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Bimo. How do you see uh, the FTA, the Kenya US, uh, or the US Kenya FTA affecting your regional markets? And then the ESC, for example, uh, is that a net plus challenges? I mean, where do you see it going? And I'll ask the same with uh, uh, Betty and uh, George as well. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think we can use the, the American knowledge uh, and, and influence much stronger. If you look at countries like Ethiopia, which are very closed off, uh, they don't want any sort of, you know, um, it's, it's mainly an Ethiopian in, you know, country which hasn't opened up yet. Some of the other regional markets are uh, still quite closed. If, if we can do some synergies with, you know, using the Kenyan businesses, bringing the American investment to Kenyan businesses, and then uh, using the American influence of Eritrea and, and Ethiopia and opening up these markets for us, I think that'll be a win-win for everybody. I think, you know, sometimes uh, as Kenyans, we may have limited influence in some of these countries and using the American strength and the strategic knowledge, I think that'll be great to open up some of these markets. So I think that it's win-win for everybody. I'm not, I'm not saying that um, uh, we, we're, we're worried or anything like that. I just think we do it correctly. We get the right investment in the country. And then for us as Kenyan businessmen, we want to export to EAC. EAC and, and, and Central Africa is, is already our biggest single market. If we combine them, they're, they're really important for all of us as Kenyan businesses and manufacturers. And I think using technology from America, uh, housing it in Kenya, we can expand our, our, our reach much more stronger. And I think if you look, if you talk to our, our counterparts in EAC, they probably think we're the America of, of, of their area. So. You know, we have to be a little bit, we have to be a little bit sensitive on, on certain issues, but we are, we're ready. We want investors, we want partnership, we want all that stuff, we, we open our doors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Betty, uh, again, regional expansion. Um, please, Betty. Yes, uh, I, I look at the FTA, just uh, like other policy, where sometimes we might a bit of a win, a bit of a lose. And then the ESC space, I look at it, it will have a bit of a in the beginning, perhaps, um, because I haven't seen it generating a lot of excitement around or near our neighbors. But I also see it as an opportunity um, for us to um, make ourselves as leaders in this region um, within, um, because based on the budget, um, technology transfer that will be available based on the improved um, systems that will be, ha will be having predictable open and transparent, um, attract um, more investor side. Uh, I think the other E is um, C, that there is an opportunity to come and engage with Kenya to see what are the learnings 
does this mean that we stop our cooperations and engagements with the ESC? No, at all. Uh, they still are very important trading blocks for us. Uh, they are important. That is a separate agreement. We are never going to pull away from it. And I think um, it's just looking at the two of them to see how can we make sure that they work together as opposed to um, uh, against each other. So there is opportunities for us to continue enhancing our growth and our relationships with our ESC counterparts. And there is opportunities as well uh, for the um, to come into Kenya and use us as a learning or a learning block for them, so that they, when they want to negotiate, we will be the teachers because we will have grown. George, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I won't go too much into the rest of it because I think it's very been very appropriately covered by my colleagues. And what I would summarize it as is that the FTA is potentially a, a knowledge pipeline. And the, the way I look at any knowledge pipeline or the way we look at it is that it's how much of it do you convert into revenue? How much of it do you convert into employment? How much of it do you convert into additional national capacity? So a very good example is we have a road now that has been built right into the Kenyan northern border into first pass a bit into uh, into Ethiopia. That road has created new opportunities and you'll find that we are able now to grow wheat in mass a bit and track them down with the new railway. So there's a lot of things from Nanyuki coming into Nairobi. So there's a new opening up and that, those are the kind of knowledge pipelines that the farmers now we need to go into those untapped areas to build into our national resource base. That's how I would transfer it and look at it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just start uh, randomly picking up questions. Um, I think there's one that's uh, controversial but interesting. Um, Jonathan uh, Kimwigi uh, asks, uh, it says, Mr. Bima, I saw in the media that uh, America wants their milk in Kenya. Isn't this going to kill the dairy industry? Uh, Bima, that's for you. Yeah, I, I would be, I would, you know, I would be cautious on these kind of media reports and you know, I, I think media likes, you know, a little bit of sensationalism to sell newspapers. Uh, you know, Kenyan milk industry is a strong industry. Don't be scared of anything, my friends. You know, if you look at some of the big companies, Brookside and KCC and uh, in the region, we, we're, we're, not, we're not small players in the region. We're, we're, we're big players. We understand the Kenyan farmer. We know the trends. It'll be, it'll be very hard for an outsider to come and penetrate the Kenyan milk market just like that. And then don't forget, we're not sleeping as Kenyan businessmen. We're here to fight. And don't tell me an American will come into the Kenyan market and take our markets just like that without, you know, Brookside putting up a really decent fight against them. So let's not underestimate Kenyan businesses. And, and, and competition is competition. Uh, let's be open to it. If they come, it'll just sharpen the Kenyan businesses. We'll get cleverer. We'll bring, you know, our costs down. Uh, as long as the government is supporting us in making, you know, uh, our pricing structure and cost structure reasonable, uh, I'm not worried. Let them come. We'll fight them on an equal basis. As long as not getting subsidized and all that sort of stuff that we're worried about. On an equal basis, we, we are, we're smart. We know our markets. We know our customers. We know our suppliers. Don't be worried. Don't be scared of anybody, guys. Yeah, just to add, I think Bimal also earlier had mentioned there are other safety mechanisms. There are anti-dumping rules, um, subsidies mentioned. And so there, free trade doesn't mean you can just do anything. It's all negotiated. And there are mechanisms for protecting uh, you know fair trade first free trade is supposed to be fair trade so that fairness is what's negotiated in uh, and how that the disputes will be handled will be a dispute uh, uh, handling mechanism in any event next question i am gonna give this to betty uh, there's a question from uh, lois uh, kikwewe uh, dr lois uh, what are the opportunities for tech transfer uh, under the FTA agreement. Can you just basically also define what uh, technology transfer and give an example and, and then the object quickly? Betty, thank you. Betty. Okay, yeah. So um, there are many opportunities for technology transfer. And what do we mean by technology transfer? Um, I'll give an example of the um, SPTA, and, um, which is um, 
type of project that we're doing for improved maize here in Kenya in collaboration with CIMIT, which is the International Maize Center for Research. Um, also um, looking at it, um, working closely with the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute. So what has been done essentially is we have donated some technologies, um, gene editor technologies to introgress into sorghum uh, here in Kenya so that um, the sorghums can be either resistant to drought and have improved um, yields. Um, that research is still ongoing. The collaboration for the technology transform is in um, between Calro, uh, Simit, and Coteva. So Coteva is donating its uh, philanthropic, through its philanthropic arm, donating uh, manpower, uh, donating knowledge, helping the local scientists understand how that technology can work and making sure they're partnering so that project is owned locally. And I see not just through the SPTA, and I, I see it through just other research opportunities. Um, Nakosti, for instance, looking for partnerships where we are able to transform some information, share knowledge. And um, if you look at the WEMA project, the Water Efficient Maze for Africa um, uh, project uh, here in Africa, that was a donation of technology um, from one organization um, then in the US um, to uh, Kenya. So that is research that is ongoing. What would happen once the results of WEMA go through, um, the technology will also be given to local seed companies who would be able to sell the seed uh, here in Kenya. And I think eventually, if all goes well, um, there'll be different seed companies with new technologies on their shelves and um, new knowledge um, on how to integrate a gene or even a technology into any of their varieties. So technology transfer will not only be part of this, uh, but also exists at the moment. But I think it will be more vibrant. It will be uh, more available and people will be able to reach out to different organizations such as George mentioned. So not just whatever, there's the universities um, and I hope um, to see that uh, we will grow our research uh, through those technology transfer opportunities. Of course, especially because our IP system will be vibrant and will be very transparent as well. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, next question is for George. Uh, there's a question from Kelvin uh, Kisa. Um, agricultural labeling is more advanced in America than in Kenya. What will be done to ensure that this differentiation does not serve as a trade uh, barrier for Kenya? Any plans for mutual recognition of different uh, country labels? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the, the word you've mentioned it very at this point is that mutual recognition. And I think Bimal alluded to it also in that it's reciprocity is the key element here. So I, in all that we are doing, we have negotiators. We know they are competent. There is an approach. They have a strategy in the negotiation. So what they are looking at is, again, something that will protect our GDP, something that will protect income and not, not dilute our revenue sources that build up towards what we do as a country or spend as our part of our budget. So definitely that will come in. And I think Betty has given a very good example in that by working with an organization such as CIMIT, Coteva is actually contributing to the bigger story in East Africa because CIMIT is a multinational. It's, it's a global organization. So these are the kind of uh, thoughts and ideas that we should actually take comfort in. But in the short term, there must be openings and ring fencing that must take place. And that's the give and take that will happen. But I'm certain, and from the Moroccan experience, they look at the revenue sources and to protect revenue pipelines for the government to ensure that they are retained. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you, George. Uh, Bima, next question is for you. Um, Joanne uh, Skikad. Skikand asks, uh, as a conservationist, I am extremely concerned regarding the impact of pesticides and fertilizers will have on fragile complex soils. Uh, please comment. Um, I assume meaning how would the FDA affect uh, probably agrochemicals and uh, the type of uh, um, 
chemicals that will be allowed uh, to enter the market. I, I mean, I'm sure already you're uh, using some American uh, agrochemicals, but just in general, how would the FDA would affect uh, agrochemical, the agrochemical market and the environment in general? Concerns about it. Environment. So let, let, let me, let me, you know, there's been in the media last 12 months, there's been a couple of NGOs and, and, and interested parties complaining that Kenya is using uh, chemicals that have been banned in Europe. I think, I think, uh, I, I think some of these, some of these discussions are more emotional than scientific. Uh, unfortunately, um, if you look at the Kenyan ecosystem and the climate, there are some chemicals we need in this country that in Europe they don't need. They're, you know, or America don't need it. They have winter. Uh, Kenya is sitting on the tropics. It, 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 it doesn't mean that whatever they use in Europe, we've got to use it in Kenya. That's very unfair what they say in some of these um, organizations. If you look at our, our government, uh, the organization called the Pest Control Board, the PCBB, it is one of the best regulated bodies in East and Central Africa. If you look at the stuff, how they approve a chemical is a three year testing process in this country. You can't just walk into the Kenya market and introduce a new chemical. PCBB is one of the toughest regulators in this country. They have a three year on field trial. After that, they approve Kenyan chemicals. So I think we have to be scientific in our, in our thinking. Um, this debate how it went to the Senate, it went to parliament and the Kenyan government was, was in a way quite upset that how can, you know, uh, other organizations outside this country heavily criticize the way we regulate our own country. We have our own rules and regulations. And if you look at what's happening in the region, the regional regulatory bodies use PCBB as the benchmark of good regulations. And I think we have to respect that. We have a very good team there. They, they protect the Kenyan farmer. And I think out of, out of every you know, 10, or 10 um, chemicals that are uh, set for registration, they register very few of them. A lot of them they reject as well because they don't comply with the Kenyan standards. And every year, PCBB has increased the standards. So now we have batch five analysis and all bunch of stuff there. So I think we, we as a Kenyan chemical industry, we're, we're very secure. I want to tell Kenyan consumer, our chemicals are extremely good chemicals and, and, and government is tough. We can't just mess around with them. If you look at the fertilizer, in, uh, I'll give you an example. I think the Kenyan uh, consumption of fertilizer is one of the lowest in the world. Compared I think we use two kilos per acre per year. The Americans use 19 or 20, some silly figure. If you compare the two, really, I mean, we're nowhere near where we should be. And, and I think using fertilizers just improves our productivity. We, we now are moving from the bulk fertilizers like the DEP into more sophisticated ones like the NPKs. We have a number of um, blending factories in Kenya. My company, Elgin Kenya, is also now doing NPK stuff. So we're also getting wiser in, in, in the Kenyan field. So a, a per capita consumption of fertilizer is still one of the lowest in the world. Fertilizers as nutrients to the soil, and we're getting cleverer. We're using much more sophisticated fertilizers in this country so that our yields come up. But please, guys, you know, use a scientific uh, um, a method of, 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 of discussion and, and less emotional, because you just scare the Kenyan one, ain't you? You know, you keep saying oh, our food is unsafe. It's just unfair on the Kenyan farmer. What happens is a Kenyan farmer, you don't buy our Kenyan produce, our farmers are suffering. The Kenyan government, the Ministry of Agriculture and PCB are one of the finest organizations I know in this country in terms of protecting the Kenyan farmer. Let's trust our government, guys. Thank you. Uh, Bima, let me just follow up on that. Um, some of the concerns might be on um, agricultural uh, produce imports into the U.S. So certain types of uh, chemical, agrochemicals may not be allowed. Are those uh, a concern or is that something you're already dealing with so it may not be a concern? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Like, like we export flowers and horticulture to the UK um, system, right? Uh, whatever markets. So the EU have come out with a list of chemicals they allow pesticides. Uh, uh, it's an approved list of pesticides we can use in the Kenyan space. So when we export our flowers, Kefis is at the airport. Kefis is at all the ports testing Kenyan produce. They are tough. They will never allow our produce leaving the country into foreign countries if they don't meet the EU guidelines or the US guidelines. So I, I think we are, we are safe. Uh, and, and if the US has their own restrictions or the chemicals they allow in their markets, Kenyan farmers are clever, will learn. And again, you know, you have, to, you have to realize we've got Cortiva here, we've got Syngenta here. We've got the American companies sitting in Kenya who we distribute for, and they usually are the guys who will then educate the Kenyan farmers using companies like mine 
where we're going to spend a lot of time with the Kenyan farmers educating which chemicals to use, if it's for an export market and for the local market. So I think those safeguards are in place and then we'll obviously learn the new stuff the American consumer wants. And again, we have to, you know, we have to, to do business, we'll do it correctly. All right, one more question for you, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a, a switch to more uh, capacity building. Um, what sort of capacity, this is from James Mbugua, uh, the question is what sort of capacity uh, would you like to see the Kenyan negotiation team have based on uh, our previous negotiations with the EU, EU EPA? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. If you look at the, the, F, the US FTA team at Ministry of Industry, they've, they've come up with a, um, uh, a TUR for a consultant, they want to hire a consultant, which I think the process is ongoing. But uh, uh, again, you know, this is new for, for our Kenyan government, it's new for us. Uh, and I think we, as time goes on, I think we're going to learn what sort of capacity we want. But again, I, I want to emphasize that we've got a very good team in, 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 in the Ministry of Trade negotiating. Obviously, there are skills they may be missing, but we'll, we'll, we'll add them on as time goes on. We're hiring this consultant, we understand. So, you know, things like, uh, and, and we've got some, I, what I did realize was that we, on that negotiating team, we've got some, some really well-trained professionals. And, and PS Wero also did tell us that they're out, they're going to have, um, they're working with a, a development agency to get some funding. They want to hire a whole bunch of, of, of interns with specific negotiating skills on specific issues with this FTA. So I think the government is conscious that they have, they have some lack of skills and they're putting the team together uh, quite quickly. So I was, I was quite encouraged that they're open-minded on bringing capacity on board. Good, yeah, I, mean, uh, I could attest to that. I spent the last three years in Kenya and uh, part of my work was on, on uh, trade promotion. And, and so um, I respect uh, the professional team at the Ministry of Trade. Uh, there's, solid, there's a solid team. Definitely, there's a need uh, for additional resources and capacity building, but uh, in, in my personal capacity, I admire the team. One of the concerns um, is that since, you know, Kenya was ex acceded to the WTO um, as part of the GATT uh, grandfathering, because Kenya was under the British rule when GATT was established in uh, 1948, uh, so Kenya didn't have to negotiate to accede. The accession process is a very grueling process. Then countries that acceded through negotiations had to beef up their capacity to negotiate. So, you know, what might have been a, a good thing may have sort of, a, in a way, undermined the Kenya's ability to negotiate. But Kenya has also experienced negotiating uh, uh, everything that's arms. So the, now, currently, there's the, the Africa Free Trade Area negotiations going on. There's the uh, trilateral, the uh, EAC, SADC, and uh, COMESA. There's a range of negotiations that are ongoing that the Kenyan government is involved in. Um, so I think uh, some of the concerns are overblown, but additional resources are always uh, great for a developing country. Uh, now, let me move to George, um, ask you a question for an anonymous attendee. Uh, the question is, is coffee part of the, this FDA? And if so, how would we get the uh, interested companies to buy coffee from Kenya? Um, and go ahead. Seems a straightforward question. <laughs> yeah, that's a simple, uh, that's a very straightforward question. I think it's purely a marketing question. And then the most important thing is what uh, I think Betty discussed earlier in, as I go very quickly through that, in that you will have to meet certain standards in that market that they require. And I think uh, Bimal alluded to it, you must spray certain chemicals, you must either have it non-sprayed, you must have it either packaged in a certain way, certain quantities, shipped in a certain way, arrived in a certain, so all those, those are just purely, that's purely a, a profit and loss mechanism, revenue and your expenses, that's the way I'd put it. But the opportunities definitely are there because there are people already doing it. Thank you. And the coffee is covered actually under the uh, GSP uh, systems, not even a part of the AGOA uh, preferential treatment, but in the FTA it may completely go into it uh, and may come out of uh, the GSP. Uh, Betty, quick question. Uh, there's a question about smallholder farmers. How would smallholder farmers be affected uh, by the FDA? This is more, this is a general question, so take a peek at it. 
Yeah, this is just going to say, I think um, the smallholder farmer is really the most upcoming farmer in Kenya. And everybody who does anything in this country, the government of Kenya always prioritizes the smallholder farmer. And I don't see um, the government doing anything that would be detrimental to the smallholder farmer. If anything, I see an opportunity for the smallholder farmer to gain knowledge um, through the transfer, um, you know, uh, to do value addition. Perhaps if they even make cooperatives for one region becoming a tomato grower and doing value addition to canning the tomatoes for export into the US. There'll be opportunities for every type of farmer in this FTA. But we all must remember that this FTA has not been finalized. This is just a discussion going on. And I don't think the government of Kenya would discuss anything that would be detrimental to its people. So thank you. Good. Uh, Bimal, back to you. There's a question from uh, Bimal Shah. And it is, uh, it says, uh, what is Kenya going to do on the raising your standards of its products that uh, it either grows or manufactures to meet the U.S. standards, as that will be the non-tariff barrier that will kick in when uh, implementing the FTA, as that is what they will uh, block Kenyan exports unless we Kenya Kenyans uh, meet their standards. Um, this would be a competitive advantage to Kenya to start doing uh, even now proactively. So this is. Uh, um, Levelized. So, in the, generally, I guess the question is um, uh, meeting the quality and quantity requirements of the market, and what 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 do Kenyan businesses need to do now uh, in anticipation of uh, the market access the FDA will provide? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, honestly, Vimal Shah is my my guru and my mentor. I, uh, the man I look up to a lot is is Vimal. You know. Uh, so, uh, so he's right. Huh? I, I think we, we're going to up our game if we want to get into the U.S. market. U.S. market is one of the most competitive in the world. It's not going to be a walk in the, in the park for us to get in that market. And we have to up our game in every way. Uh, if you look at what, how, why was the Kenyan textile uh, manufacturer so successful in, in the U.S. market? Because if the level of investment the Kenyan manufacturer did, people like Jazz, Bedi, the amount of investment they did in their factories, raising their standards was, you know, it's, it was impressive. And I think for Kenyan people, Kenyan businesses, for us to access the U.S. market, we have to be smart. We have to be. We have to invest in our factories. Uh, and and George said the same thing that you know, as as we learn what the standards are, we'll have to learn what what the American consumer wants. But I, I look at the textile industry. If they were successful in Kenya, everybody else we we have it in us. I I'm not scared. But we have to learn. It's going to take us a couple of years to learn. And that's why we need capacity building. We need people to teach us what the American consumer wants, what the consumer eats, what kind of flowers he likes. And this is the type of stuff we got, we're going to have to learn over the next couple of years. But again, let's not underestimate the American consumer. He can buy from wherever he wants in the world, right? I mean, you have the Chinese sitting out there who are just about, you know, who are so clever. Um, and for us, Kenyan businessmen, to get into the American market is going to be difficult. And that's why my worry is this is an FTA. It's not a preferential agreement. If it was a preferential agreement with agriculture in Indians, they would have supported us through, you know, indirectly, you know, to get us out there and, and given us time to, to build ourselves up. But because it's an FTA, that worries me a little bit more. If it was a you know, preferential agreement, I would have been much happier. But anyway, it is what it is. And we just have to, as Kenyan businesses, up our game, make sure that, uh, you know, we understand the, the needs of the consumer in America. We need to have more trade, you know, delegations going to America, learning their systems. Uh, and, and then build our capacities internally. Uh, it's going to take some time. I, I don't think it's going to be an easy one, to be honest. They're very clever people in America. They're consumers. Uh, they're sophisticated, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, George, let me ask the same question. Since you've uh, visited Morocco and uh, looked at how Morocco has adapted to its FTA, how did Morocco uh, up its game in terms of uh, meeting the quantity and quality requirements of the U.S. market? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I think basically one thing was that uh, they had a very well-structured negotiating team, experienced people, like, I mean, like, as you'd expect in such a country. But most importantly was that they had an agricultural strategy that had some force behind it, something running behind it and implementing 
aspects on it at particular points. So that's why I mentioned that the green plan, the, the green Morocco plan, one of its key objectives, if you look at it, was to ensure you, you improve the rural livelihood, the quality of life in the rural areas so that it could attract farmers, it could attract investment to those farmers. So today, you'll, you'll go into a particular area and the, the same way we do with real estate, whereby we put together electrical power lines, we put in water supply, roads and everything, they put in water, they put in the, the roads to deliver to the port and so on. So that's why organizations such as OCP have got quick turnaround times for huge volumes of deliveries across Africa and in the world. That's one side of it. Then the second side, they identified their strengths very early. The weather and the seasonality. In agriculture, the key to revenue is seasonality. When there's too much of something, the prices are depressed. When there's enough of something, the prices are medium. So that seasonality was a very big driver for any activity, for anything they were doing. So that's how they built up the capacity. And it took them several years. And this is something that they're still building on up to today. And that's why you see OCP now, because of those institutional and infrastructural changes in the country, are able to come to East Africa. So we should be able to go to other countries, similarly the way they have done. And I think that's, I'll leave it at that. Okay, Maxwell, I'm gonna um, allow or at least request uh, one of the questioners to speak, uh, to ask a question, Stanley Maina. Uh, Eva or Maxwell, can you allow the, if they're still um, here? Yeah, Eva, Eva, go ahead, Stanley Maina. And, and as you're unmuting Stanley Maina, I, I have a quick question for you, Bimal. Um, you know, there, there's always this perception that in an argument such as this, it's really for the big boys. It's the big companies out there that will get uh, benefit, um, especially here locally. Um, what's, what's your view around that? I think this is a great opportunity for smaller sized businesses, be able to take advantage, you know, partner with the right organizations and businesses in the U.S. and really get to scale up their, um, you know, their capacity, their standards. And, 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 you know, as you're saying, this is really a matter of how you position yourself and what you see as the opportunity versus the challenge. So I just need uh, just some quick reflections from you on that. Yeah, so let me, let me give you two perspectives. Okay, it's true, big businesses have got big resources and they, they may be quicker off the mark. But if you look at companies like VegPro, I'll give an example of AAA Grow as well. One of the companies I think will be great exporters to the US. These guys are horticulture exporters. But the bulk of their produce comes from small older farmers. They have a great outreach program. They use a lot of outreach of farmers. So I think uh, uh, the secret is getting a market open. Once you get the market open, then companies like you know, VegPro, AAA, uh, Kenya Horticulture Exports, all these guys, avocado guys, they, they tend to then outsource their production to the small farmer. So that's one perspective. Second perspective, I think, and I think it's very important the Kenya government gets this right, that we could, we could we, this is, uh, agreement is one thing, signing agreement, but what are, the, what are the things they're going to put in place to help us achieve our targets of getting this FTA done? So they need to have a strong export promotion center. Already we have one. Mm -hmm. They need to fund it. They need to make sure that the people in those export promotion companies uh, or, or you know, government departments have got resources to assist smaller and medium-sized companies reach potential of, of, of exporting. I think it's, it's, not, it's, it's not simple just to sign agreement and Kenyan businesses will get on with it. We do need support from the Kenyan government. Maybe even the American government can help us with resources, with, with capacity, with mental thought, with, with uh, you know, ideas. Uh, all these things are, are going to take time. It's going to take us three, four years to fully implement, um, once a document is signed, to fully implement the full potential of the FTA. But it does require kind of government assistance, particularly for the small and medium enterprise. The, the big companies, I think they're well organized and they have enough money to, to sort themselves out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Bimal. Stanley, Stanley Maina, your mic is unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Stanley, just unmute your mic and ask your question if you're still on the line. Okay, okay. yeah, just go ahead, yeah. Johannes. 
Yeah, I mean, his question is, uh, again, I picked him because the, the theme is there. The several people uh, have brought up the question of subsidies. I know Bimal has uh, uh, mentioned it earlier, but the, uh, the flip side of uh, the subsidies concern is there's also Kenyan subsidies, as small as it may be. I think there's a new reform uh, on agricultural subsidies for, uh, for both the pre and post uh, harvest uh, subsidies. Um, but the, the, the concern is how would the subsidies, the Kenya government's ability to provide subsidies in the future would be affected. Um, and then on the flip side, of course, Bimal has addressed it earlier, uh, American government subsidies for American uh, farmers. Um, but uh, Bima, you, you can pick this up since you've already touched upon on this issue before. Yeah, so it's a highly controversial subject. If you look at the American uh, document that has been published on the objectives, they say <laughs> that they will reduce subsidies and tariffs, but they have to get Congress permission. So, I mean, you know, this, we're dealing with some really sophisticated, clever people against us. Um, and the, and the American farmer is subsidized, is heavily subsidized, I mean, indirectly or directly. So we have to be a little bit cautious that um, we don't, uh, you know, whatever comes into the Kenyan market, we've got to have systems in place to check where the original produce came from. Uh, we, of course, WTO is there, obviously, but again, you know, that these things are, are expensive and hard to go and do a legal action against America under WTO rules. So the subsidy issue is worrying us all the time. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the American farmer, for instance, I'll give you an example, uh, Johannes. If you look at the poultry industry, for instance, uh, the, the, the American poultry farmer, the chicken legs are for him free. He throws it away normally. So, we, you know, for him to export to Kenyan market is very simple. But I, I want to rest some worries out there. When we spoke to P.S. Vero, he did say there are sensitive, sensitive areas in the agriculture value chain which will be protected. And he did mention poultry is going to be one of them. So they have a sensitive list. And they've also asked us to contribute and our thoughts into which areas we think are and too, too difficult to open or too young to open so quickly. So I think we, we have a window of opportunity there. We need to, to discuss and negotiate with the Kenyan government which areas we should protect completely without being part of the FTA and which parts of agriculture we can open up quite quickly. So, yeah, but it's, I think this is a very sensitive subject on subsidies for sure. And on the Kenyan side, the Kenyan government's ability to subsidize Kenyan farmers. Yeah, so there is no subsidy program right now in the Kenyan system. We used to have the subsidized fertilizer, which, thank God, Kenyan government got rid of uh, because they were competing with my company, for instance. How would I compete with Kenyan fertilizer in the government? So, but they're coming up with this e-voucher program, which is an interesting one. So they are trying indirectly to subsidize the Kenyan farmer. They're going to give each farmer a debit card. So they go to AgroVet. And I think for every, you know, 4,000 shillings the, the farmer will, will buy, I think one or 2,000 shillings the Kenyan government will subsidize. But it's still in a very um, young stage and poly poly, they're understanding how to work technology, transferring the subsidy to the AgroVet. But at the moment, there is no open subsidy program for the Kenyan farmer, which is really, uh, I'm not very happy with it. You know, they should be putting more money in the Kenyan uh, agriculture space uh, instead of putting it in another sector. I think if you subsidize the Kenyan farmer, the, the knock-on effect or the multiply effect in this economy is going to be massive. But that's another debate for another time, Johannes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the issue comes up as the ability to uh, subsidize in the future is the question that comes up. Um, Maxwell, I think we're um, at the end of our program. And so I hand over uh, the mic back to you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, this lively and uh, educating session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Johannes, for your expert uh, and skillful um, you know, management and moderation of the, of the panel. And to our panelists, uh, a really, really big thank you for, for your nuggets. Um, before we close, and I give my closing remarks, I just want to invite um, our attendees to take a quick poll. It's coming up right now on your screen. It will only take 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, it's one question only. One question only, 30 seconds, and we'll tell you the results of the poll just shortly. Um, Eva, you can hear me, please. At 30 seconds, just read out or announce the results of the poll.
is filling, filling. I see it's still at, uh, it's not moving. We're at 61%, let's go. <laughs> the wonders of technology. <laughs> 64%. All right, I think we can, we can close it there. It doesn't seem to be moving any further than that. Um, so yeah, from what you can see, the question is how optimistic are you about agriculture sector's prospects with the potential free trade area? About 29% of those attended do say very optimistic. 44% say optimistic. And 9% uh, are not sure, they don't know. And 19% are not optimistic at all. So um, that's uh, what, about um, uh, three, I'd say what, 73% uh, think that, uh, you know, this is a good idea and that, you know, the prospects are good for the agriculture sector. So that's great. Um, I really want at this point to, you know, just a couple of words. I know we sit with Bimal in the same private sector uh, consortium. And under Kepsander, there are several um, private sector bodies in there, including AMCHAM, ASNET, um, KEPSA, um, KNCCI, CAM. We have Kenya Healthcare Federation that is engaging the government as a private sector group, as a private sector consortium um, on this FTA. And while the FTA is primarily a government to government um, engagement, we are providing advisory, we are providing input, and forums such as this help get us input and the concerns that there may be the, the, the thinking that there is from the private sector and, and other players um, so that we're able to feed those who are going to be actually negotiating on behalf of government. Um, we can feed them with the right information. We also mentioned earlier, I think Bimal captured this, that uh, we are presenting position papers under each of the now 16 chapters that the Kenya government will be negotiating this FTA on. I also want to agree in our engagements with government, we get a sense that there's a very solid team behind the, um, the negotiations from the Kenyan side. Yes, they do admit that they do have some capacity constraints here and there, and they are already working on uh, solutions to help bolster that. But we are very, very confident that there's a team there that we can trust to make the right decisions and negotiate an appropriate win-win deal under this trade agreement for Kenya. And of course, for the prosperity, mutual prosperity of both our countries. This is going to be quite a process. It's not something that uh, happens uh, quickly. It's gonna take at least a year plus. In fact, in most cases, it's usually a three year process, but we believe that with the commitment that we are seeing from both governments to kick this forward and make sure that, uh, you know, they're able to close it in the shortest period possible, we will end up with a trade agreement uh, before too long. So with those few remarks, I want to really um, thank our panel. Um, I want to thank Betty Kotiva. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, George, for your great insights. Thank you, Bimal, um, for sharing your nuggets of wisdom. And of course, a big thank you, special thank you to Johannes, joining us early your morning from the US to moderate this uh, very, very important panel. As we mentioned, this is the first of a series the next one will be on SMEs. We're actually going to engage SMEs and have a similar discussion. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? How can we prepare as SMEs to be able to take advantage of this FTA when it comes online? So I want to finally thank all those who took their time to join this um, webinar. We've had close to 200 people on the call. Um, it's been a great interactive session. I've been edified in this process and we hope that in your attendance, you're able to also learn a few things and you know, just this whole FTA um, conversation just be starting to become a little more um, understandable. We are demystifying it, that, that's what we want to do. And so thank you very much for participating. As Amcham, we've put together an FTA information hub that can be found on our website. If you go to www.amcham, amcham, that's A M chamco.ke slash forward slash FTA, you'll be able to get quite a number of resources there, including the various negotiating objectives, both from the US and the Kenyan side, um, the various press releases that, we, that have been given, and we'll keep updating this. 
so that you can get information as the uh, negotiations progress and information becomes available. So look, do look out for the FTAs that are, uh, FTA uh, webinars that are going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all once again. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, our participants. We've come to the end of our forum and have a good evening and a good day to you, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.